a sequel to Magpie Murders, a prequel to Magpie Murders, three unique timelines containing three unique mysteries, clues in the present might reveal killers in the past and danger in the future. Get your magnifying glass out, Clue Crew. This one's a doozy. Let's solve Moonflower Murders, Episode 1. Susan is tasked with finding a missing woman whose disappearance is connected with an Alan Conway novel. We'll be breaking down each episode for clues, suspects, and red herrings on the hunt to learn what happened to the missing daughter Cecily, and did the police arrest the correct person in the Frank Paris murder eight years ago? Plus, in the novel Atticus Boone Takes the Case, who killed the actress Melissa James? Dang, we got an info dump of a first episode. Spoilers for the first episode of Moonflower Murders. If you haven't seen the first episode, pause this video, take a shower in your kitchen, then enjoy a nice salad by the pool, and come back and watch. Now this first episode throws a lot of things at the audience. Did you survive that information overload? By my count, you're asked to take in 26 characters across three timelines. Because there's so much to take in, we're going to take a moment to restate the challenges before the viewer. Eight years ago, Frank Paris was murdered in his hotel room. The police arrested a maintenance worker at the hotel. Later, that worker, Stefan, confessed to killing Frank Paris. Okay, open and shut. Now, shortly after Frank Paris was killed, author Alan Conway began to write his third mystery novel around his detective character, Atticus Boone. That third novel, Atticus Boone Takes the Case, that story is set in 1954, and it revolves around the death of an actress, Melissa James. But the location and many of the characters appear to be based on real-life locations and people associated with the Frank Paris murder. Now, in the present timeline, the daughter of the owners of the hotel where Frank was killed, Cecily, she has read the book, Atticus Poon Takes the Case. She believes that something in the book reveals that Stefan didn't kill Frank Paris, and now she's gone missing. So we've got a lot of mysteries to solve. Who killed Frank Paris if it wasn't Stefan? Why did Stefan confess to killing Frank Paris if he didn't do it? Who killed Melissa James in the novel? And where is Cecily? we got to solve all those mysteries. Buckle your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy ride. If you're a fan of Magpie Murders and Moonflower Murders, either the books or the TV show, know that we got some great news this week. Author Anthony Horowitz's third novel in this series, Marble Hall Murders, say that three times fast, was announced it's going to be released in March of 2025 in the UK and May of 2025 in the US. I believe that means they're going to start producing the third series next year, 2025, and we can expect to see it in 2026. Use the timestamps below to jump to the topic or suspect you want to hear and skip past stuff you don't want to hear. We invite you to join us on all our Let's Solve Murder Mystery videos. We've covered each episode of Only Murders in the Buildings, Seasons 1 through 4. We've covered The After Party Season 2, as well as A Murder at the End of the World, and the original Magpie Murders. Again, we welcome you to join the Clue Crew. Use your little gray selves. Let's solve these fun murder mysteries. Because we've got so many timelines and so many suspects, let's deal with only the real-life stories right now. Let's begin with what episode one taught us about the real-life story in the present timeline. That's our missing person, Cecily Traherne. Now, eight years ago, Cecily married her boyfriend of two years, Aiden McNeil. They got married at her parents' hotel, Brownlow Hall, where she works. Now, the night before the wedding, Cecily threw a party for the hotel staff since they would be working on Saturday and wouldn't be part of the wedding ceremony or the reception. Cecily always liked hotel maintenance worker Stefan, and she wanted to believe he was innocent, but later he confessed to killing Frank Paris. Eight years later, Cecily is reading Alan Conway's book, Atticus Boone Takes the Case. After she completes the book, she suddenly believes Stefan was innocent, and the killer is named in the novel. She calls her father on the phone, tells him Stefan is innocent, and the real-life killer is named in the book. Suddenly, somebody enters her office. She hangs up the phone quickly. The next day, on May 9th, she has disappeared. Now, take a look at this newspaper report. From it, we can find out that Cecily was 28 years old. She's 5'9 with long red hair. It says she's a mother of one, so she and Aiden must have a kid. 
The article mentions she wore a distinctive gold pendant of a Sagittarius. According to Susan, she's been missing for five days. Her mother claims there have been sightings of her, and someone claims to have seen her in Norfolk, but Cecily has not shown up. According to her parents, Cecily didn't become a character in the book, which seems a bit odd since her sister did, her parents did, her husband did. Why didn't Cecily become a character in the book? Or did she? And what is it that Cecily saw in the novel? Now, we also should look at what this episode taught us about the murder victim eight years ago, Frank Paris. Frank came to England from Australia to visit his sister, who lives in a town called Wesselton. He checked into the hotel that Friday, the day before the wedding. After seeing his room, Frank hated it. It was too small, it looked over the hotel's parking lot, so he went back to the front desk and demanded a different suite. He seemed sensitive that maybe Aiden knew his name. Aiden says he was just reading it off a computer, but is he being honest? Now, two hours after the hotel staff party, sometime after midnight, Frank was murdered, seemingly by being bludgeoned by a hammer in his bed. <laughs> Tough way to go. The door to Frank's hotel room had not been forced open, so whomever entered, either Frank let him into the room or they had a key. And apparently, everyone working at the hotel had access to a key. Frank's wallet was empty. There was blood inside the fold, suggesting that after he was killed, somebody went in and got his money. Now let's look at the suspects in real life. Susan Ryland. Now Susan is our detective. She's our Sherlock Holmes, our Hercule Perot, our Miss Marple. So it's unlikely that she did it. Susan is a former editor of the late Alan Conway's popular Atticus Spoon murder mystery novels. After Magpie Murder, she left England and the book publishing world and moved to Greece with her boyfriend, Andreas, to run a hotel. Now, this Greek island may be a paradise, but her life is not a paradise. The guests threaten her with bad TripAdvisor reviews. The hotel loses electricity. The kitchen's underwater. She's looking for other work. She's walking across the countryside a lot of times, probably just to get some peace. But as she does it, she sees visions of the detective Atticus Poon haunting her. Susan is approached by Cecily's parents. They're offering her $10,000 to help find their daughter. Susan suspects that Cecily is dead, and she feels a bit of guilt because if Alan Conway did base his book on a murder from their hotel, could she bear a bit of responsibility? Susan's boyfriend, Andreas Patakis. In the first series, Magpie Murders, Andreas got the money to run and buy this hotel from the late author, Alan Conway. Andreas is always trying to put a happy face on all the problems in their life. His cousin, Giannis, who was supposed to support them and support the hotel, he's not around much. Andreas believes everything to do with the late author, Alan Conway, is bad. If you didn't watch the first series, Magpie Murders, Andreas was a teacher in England, and Alan Conway taught at the same school as Andreas before Alan hit it big as an author. Continuing with the suspects, there's Cecily's father, hotel owner Lawrence Treherne. In Cecily's wedding toast eight years ago, she celebrates her parents for buying and creating the hotel, Bronlow Hall in Suffolk. Lawrence and his wife, Pauline, they visit Susan in Greece. They beg for her help to find their daughter. Eight years ago, Lawrence was working the front desk when Frank checked in and then when he came back later to complain about his room. Pauline thinks her daughter is frightened and hiding. Again, they're offering Susan 10,000 pounds to come to the hotel, read the book, find the clue, find their daughter. Cecily's sister, Lisa Traherne. Eight years ago, Lisa fired Stefan after a series of petty thefts happened around the hotel. And Lisa is quick to tell Detective Locke that Stefan had a master key to the hotel room and a prison record and that he'd been fired all when Locke is looking into the death of Frank Paris. We've got Cecily's husband, Aidan McNeil. Aiden met Cecily two years before they were married. Cecily mentions in her wedding toast that the two met each other on Aiden's birthday, August 16th. He was an estate agent, a.k.a. a realtor, who set Cecily up with a flat or an apartment. In his wedding toast, Aiden jokes that the Traherne women have all the power. Aiden, Cecily, and Cecily's sister, Lisa, they've been running this hotel for eight years since the wedding. Aiden was there eight years ago when Frank Paris was complaining about his room, and Aiden was the nice guy who switched the bigger room for the Moonflower Wing. According to his father-in-law, Lawrence, Aiden gets stuck dealing with the tricky customers because he's a likable dude. 
Eight years ago at the wedding, during Aiden's toast, Aiden gave a special toast to his mother, who came down from Derbyshire. Now, a Wikipedia-level research, or a Google Maps-level research, says that Derbyshire is in the East Midlands of England, and then here is Suffolk, where the hotel Brownlow Hall is supposed to be. At the hotel, there's the night manager, Derek. Eight years ago, Derek carried Frank Paris's luggage from his car up to the hotel and then to Frank's original room. Came back down with Frank after Frank demanded a different room. But Frank waved off Derek's help and asked instead for Aiden to take his bags up. Now, on the night, Friday night into Saturday night when Frank was killed, Derek was working the reception desk and he had access with a master key. Derek told the police that he saw maintenance worker Stefan in the Moonflower Wing, where Frank's room was, just before midnight on the night Frank died. There's hotel maid Natasha. Eight years ago, this Russian maid Natasha, she went to clean Frank Paris's room late in the afternoon this Saturday and discovered his dead body. She comes out in an apparent daze. She's stumbling out into the wedding reception. At times, she's speaking her native Russian. Natasha puts two bloody handprints on Cecily's wedding dress. Now, we do have to mention hotel maintenance worker Stefan. He had been in prison for burglary and theft, but he got released and he'd been working at the hotel for eight months. At that staff party on Friday night, the night before the wedding, Stefan is tired, he's drinking, and he's shooting darts at Lisa, who had given him his notice after these petty thefts. Stefan denies that he was the person responsible for those thefts to Detective Locke the following day. Stefan said he was asleep and he didn't go to Frank Paris's room the night he died. He says Derek, the overnight guy, is a good friend, but he's wrong when he claims, hey, I was in the Moonflower Wing. Again, Stefan says he was sleeping. There is blood on Stefan's bedsheet and bloody money found in a book at his bedside table. Stefan claimed he was innocent initially, but later confessed to the crime. The jury found him guilty and gave him a life sentence. This one character hasn't been named yet, but according to the credits, this is a hotel worker named Liam. At the party the night before the wedding, Liam is trying to cheer up Stefan. You know, telling him, hey, you can find another job, you can find another job. Stefan doesn't want to hear it. Now, the actor playing Liam doesn't have many lines, but doesn't it sound like he's Australian? We have police detective Locke. Now, he was in the first series, Magpie Murders. And during that time, he and Susan had a real frustrating relationship. They butted heads all the time. Author Alan Conway. Now, Alan died in the first series, which is entitled Magpie Murders. It's the story of Alan Conway's death. He wrote all these Atticus Boone murder mysteries, but the first series showed us that Alan really hated the murder mystery genre. He hated the fans. He hated the character Atticus Boone. He wanted to write high literature, not these pulpy novels, which he felt were beneath him. Alan showed Susan, apparently, a picture of Frank Paris in a newspaper story about the murder. Susan told him it'd be a good idea for a story. Later, he went to the hotel, and he did write a book which used a lot of the locations as people as inspiration for this story, Atticus Poon Takes the Case. Now, despite the real-life mystery taking place in Suffolk, he set his story on the opposite side of England, in Devonshire, Agatha Christie's stomping ground. Finally, there's Cecily's dog, Chase. Eight years ago, Chase was just hanging out in the hotel lobby. Let's give it a one-star review on TripAdvisor. Hey, that's not cool. If you look at that newspaper article, Cecily took the dog for its usual walk. Several hours later, the dog returned home alone. Okay, that's it for Cecily Clues. That's it for the clues from eight years ago at Frank Paris. Who do you got as your suspects? Where's Cecily? Write down in the comments here on YouTube. Give us a like, subscribe if you are fascinated by this murder mystery. You can also reach out to us on social media at Double P H Q. That's the word double, single letter P for podcast, HQ for headquarters, at Double P H Q on Twitter, Instagram, threads, Facebook.com slash Double P H Q. We want to connect with you on social media. Now we got to turn to even more information, and that's, let's look at this book, Atticus Poon Takes the Case, and let's see what the first episode taught us about the murder victim in the novel, actress Melissa James. Note, based on Cecily's sister, Lisa. Now, this story is set in 1954 in a village of Tawley. Melissa James is a famous British actress. She starred in many Hollywood films until an accident on a set of an Alfred Hitchcock film ended her career. And she's got a scar on her cheek to show for it. Looking at Hitchcock's filmography, maybe this was his film Strangers on a Train that she got injured on. Maybe I Confess or Stage Fright. We don't know for sure. What do you think? What film did Melissa James get injured on? 
but the insurance money from that injury gave her the ability to purchase a hotel and name it the Moonflower. Some fan sent Melissa a letter to the hotel. They're disappointed that she has quit acting, claiming a light has gone out of our lives. Now, Melissa is furious the whole episode. First, she's mad that the Moonflower Hotel is losing money hand over fist. She tells the hotel managers that she's asked her financial advisor to do a complete audit. She's also been avoiding film producer Oscar Boleyn's call for six weeks. She doesn't want to be in his movie. After she leaves this frustrating hotel, she drives by the church and past her doctor and arrives to her house, Clarence Keep. You know, she's a big movie star. This doesn't look like a giant mansion, but it does have these two big lion statues outside. Melissa and her husband, John, they're meant to attend the opera this night, but she doesn't want to go. She claims it's boring. She doesn't like her husband. John, she says he's from a posh world. She doesn't like it. There's an odd moment when Melissa is home in her own hallway. It's just her. It's like she's staring at a picture. Something's going on there. When her financial advisor shows up, Melissa complains to him. She says, Algernon, she needs money. The house, the hotel, the marriage, they're all bleeding her dry. Nothing's making money. She wants to cash in her shares of the stock. Later that night, there's a white cord wrapped around Melissa James's body as her corpse lies on a bed. Now let's look at the suspects in the novel. Atticus Pund. Again, he's our Sherlock Holmes. In this story, he's the world's greatest detective. Now, since the first series, Magpie Murders, Susan has been imagining Atticus, and they discuss various mysteries and things going on in Susan's life. Atticus acts as Susan's conscious, almost a Jiminy Cricket. In the world of the books, Atticus wrote a book himself entitled The Landscape of Criminal Investigation. Film producer Oscar Berlin. He's based off Frank Paris. Now, Oscar has spent three years on pre-production for his film, The Queen's Ransom. He's ready to start production, but Melissa James hasn't signed on. And in fact, she tells him she's decided not to do the film entirely. This is bad. Oscar raised the money for the film pretty much off Melissa James's name. If she doesn't appear in the film, he'll have to start over. His three years have been wasted. There's hotel managers Lance Gardner and his wife Maureen Gardner. They are obviously based off the hotel owner Lawrence Traherne and his wife Pauline Traherne. Melissa James shows up at the Moonflower Hotel without warning them. She catches Lance not working at all. Instead, he's listening to horse racing on the wireless. When they hear that Melissa wants to audit the hotel, they seem very, very nervous. Melissa's financial advisor, Algernon Marsh, who's based off Aidan McNeil. Now, this guy is a complete wreck, literally. He's smoking and drinking while driving. He has a terrible hit and run on a pedestrian, just drives away, doesn't do anything, doesn't get the guy to a hospital. Just as bad as he is at driving, Algernon is worse with Melissa's money. He hates the idea that Melissa wants to sell her shares in a stock called Day's End, a stock that he selected. She's yelling at Algernon, saying it's not making any money. Later, Susan herself spoils a bit of the novel and says Algernon is ripping off Melissa entirely. Now, in seemingly a B-plot to the story, Algernon has a sister named Samantha Collins. Samantha has inherited 980,000 pounds from her aunt who died. The aunt didn't leave any money to the brother Algernon. Samantha feels guilty. She feels like she has to tell her brother, support her brother. But she knows that's a sore point with her husband. She hasn't even mentioned to her husband that Algernon will be staying with them. Samantha's husband, Algernon's brother-in-law, is Dr. Leonard Collins. He is thrilled over the moon that his wife inherited this huge amount of money. But he is very frustrated that she's feeling guilty and she might share her windfall with her no-good brother. He drops the information about the inheritance into his desk drawer. At Melissa James's house, the Clarence Key place, there's a handyman named Eric who is based off the hotel night manager Derek in the real world. Eric is very afraid Melissa James is going to find out a secret. He's worried that she already knows the secret. There at the house, Eric's mother is Phyllis. She's a maid and a cook for Melissa James. Phyllis and her son are going to take the night off, go visit her sister. And they intend to take Melissa's car to get there. Phyllis feels like her son deserves something bad to happen to him if this secret is discovered. So Phyllis knows it. Later on, Melissa says she wants a word with Phyllis and Eric before they leave to visit the sister. 
Finally, we've got Melissa James's husband, John Spencer. When John finds out Melissa doesn't want to go to the opera, he says, I don't want to go either. It's the marriage of Figaro. Let's just stay home. But Melissa says, no, you've got to go. Melissa claims John takes money for granted, that he doesn't believe in work. Now, John gave up his title. He says he gave up everything to marry Melissa. His parents didn't even approve of her. But Melissa is not hearing it. She orders him to sleep in a different room when he returns from the opera. John does get in his car and leave, but then we see him stop and turn around. Ooh, 26 characters, three timelines, how are you doing? So much to solve. Spoiler alert, we haven't actually met all the characters yet. Get ready. This is like a Game of Thrones giant cast, but that means there are a lot of suspects, a lot of clues. Who do you suspect after one episode? If you're on YouTube, go down in the comments. I want to hear from you. Who do you suspect? If you're on social media, at Double PHQ, tell me what do you think. Now, this is based on a book, and I'll be honest, I've read the book, so I can't really do any guessings because most likely this will be the same killer or killers from the book that appear in this TV adaptation. But I still want to hear from you. We've got to solve it. Can we solve it? Let's solve Moonflower Murders. We're going to be back with episode two next week.